give the five second warning now. Five, four, three, two, one. We're live! Um, I am Debbie Dingle, and I'm really happy to be here with my colleagues. Each of us is going to say a few words. We want to thank those of you who rain, nor sleep, nor snow, will keep home to talk to your elected officials. We had, as um, Abdul has just said, we had more, we had 400 people say they were coming tonight. So you guys are the brave ones. <laughs> and um, that's why I did not come back to Washington, because uh, I really wanted to, I'm gonna go back up, I'm leaving the house at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning to go back, because I think we really need to open the government. And yes. then too many of our next <laughs> And I would have missed tonight town hall if we were actually having a vote to reopen the government, which we, they were not tonight. But I, I, I have to say to you that we are just, there are, we have a lot of our neighbors. There are a lot of people in this community that are suffering. There are TSA officers who can't afford to get to work. They have, none of these people have been paid for 31 days. And there's another, I've got so many stories now. Another woman called me, her child's in daycare. She hasn't been paid in lunch. She can't pay for a daycare. She's going to lose her place in daycare. She doesn't pay for it because she's been deemed an essential employee. She can't take the time off to take care of her child. And she's working the midnight shift at Denny's just to pay for her child who needs in daycare. You've got Secret Service agents. You've got FBI, uh, Coast Guard. Custom and Border Patrol, uh, all of the Custom and Border Patrol, who the president is saying that he's fighting for, by the way, there's 3,000 not filled Custom and Border Patrol positions right now before we ever talk about keeping our border secure. So the four of us are colleagues and friends, and we work really closely together at the state, federal, and local level to represent you. So we are going to do it. Uh, we, all issues are on the table. Um, when we talk to, we want to do this regularly. You're the first town hall of this new session for all of us. Sam is new. The three of us uh, have been uh, in the legislature before. So Sylvia is now a state senator. This is your new state senator. Abdullah and I, I guess, are the old ones at the table tonight. Um, but we want to hear what's on your mind. So I'm not going to talk for long. I could talk about a lot of subjects. But the fact that you came out in bad weather, when you do go home, drive safely, we thank you. And rather than talk a lot more, I'm going to turn it over to Abdullah. Good evening. Come on, we're all here together this beautiful night. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to the Congresswoman, to Wayne County Commissioner Sam Bidou, and State uh, Senator Sylvia Santana uh, as well for, for joining us. Um, you know, today, as Congresswoman Dingle indicated, is the first of many stops, hopefully, in a new term. Uh, we're not here to be partisan. Uh, more than anything, we're here to listen. Uh, there are new dynamics in both the state and federal governments. We have a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature uh, with smaller margins, hopefully brewing more bipartisanship, and as well as uh, at the federal level, you have a Republican president, a Democratic House, and a Republican Senate. Uh, hopefully, that's also going to create more bipartisanship. Uh, so more than anything, we want to listen, listen from you, uh, to listen about what issues would you like us to focus on in this new term. Uh, for those uh, who have been active over the last several years, know that my office, as well as my colleagues, I've been working on many issues, including air quality in the area of Dearborn, uh, including healthcare <laughs> access, including testing the substance and drug use epidemic. Uh, that's uh, you know not only in our community but communities across the state. Um, and I want to have a uh, renewed effort, renewed conversation uh, about said topics, but also to talk about anything else that's come about. Uh, throughout the night, we'll give some updates of how we closed out the last term, some things we're able to conclude with. Uh, for example, uh, Rep. Uh, State Senator uh, Santana, representative at the time, um, and myself were able to uh, secure $6.7 million for Henry Ford College to build a new entrepreneurship institute. And that will be, uh, uh, in addition to an already $8 million 
the county of Fort Collins will add in addition to that, uh, making the total investment roughly $15 million uh, for a, two, a new autonomous engineering center here in the city of Dearborn, unlike anything we have in the entirety uh, of the country. Um, so hopefully it'll be a uh, center for, uh, uh, for the 21st century jobs, is how we see this. Um, more than that, we were able to secure funding also for the Air American Museum, the Henry Ford Museum, uh, kayaking is to come to the Rouge River. Uh, who's to, who, who, who imagined that 20 years ago, growing up in the city, we would never swim in the Rouge River, uh, and here we are securing funding to go kayaking in the Rouge River. Uh, you know who mentioned that? John Kugel, who is the one who got the money and saw fish and did kayaking in the streets. God bless John Kugel. Uh, buy his book if you haven't bought it yet. Uh, but that, that's why we're here. I'll pass it over to, uh, to my colleague to the right. Um, but we're excited to be here, excited to listen, excited to take notes. And excited to you know build upon the work that we've uh, started to build on. And excited to add uh, Sam Bayoun in official capacity. He's always been active throughout our community, uh, and now he just has nothing more than a, a title to do the work that he's been doing. Um, so thank you again for being here. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm State Senator Sylvia Santana. Obviously, I represent the third district Senate seat. Um, that is Dearborn, Detroit, as well as Melvindale, and I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Dingle, for um, bringing me to the table as well. Um, I've always it worked well with you. Elected yourself, you earned your seat. Women earned their seat. Okay, I'm going to make you clear. You yes, absolutely earned it very much so. But anyhow, um, I just want to say. Um, you know, I have my colleague here, Abdullah Hamoud, we work very well in partnership as well as I'm happy to have um, Sam serving in the capacity at the local level with um, the commission seat. But these partnerships are very important. Uh, we, government should, obviously it has its own issues from the federal down to the local level, but we should not operate in silos. Um, definitely when there's opportunities for us to collaborate on issues that impact the people in our state, we wanna make sure that we continue to work together. And so, with the let that said, obviously there's been legislation passed at the state level, some good, some not so good, but definitely that is the conversation that we wanna to have today. What, what issues impact the community? What concerns are there from the community as a whole? Um, definitely, as mentioned, we do have our own policies and agendas in place that we think would help support the communities, but we have to hear from the people on the ground. That is so important that we continue to make sure that we are listening here to everyone. And so some of the questions that I pose um, just off of bill packages that I um, actually introduced, reintroduced this year uh, regarding our mental health issue. Where do we need to be as a state? Um, definitely auto insurance has been a conversation that's been on the table. I've knocked on several people's doors um, in the communities and that has been a priority. But I think that most importantly, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what can we do at the state, federal, and local level to impact your lives and make sure that Michiganders um, have a quality of life that represents the people. So with that said, I will pass the mic on to um, our new uh, commissioner, Sam Bayou. Thank you. Good evening. Assalamu uh, alaikum. I'm honored to be here with my good friend, Congresswoman Debbie Dingo, uh, Representative Abdullah Hamoud, and our newly elected Senator, Sylvia Santana. Um, yes, this is my first town hall meeting, and I'm honored to share the stage with these three distinguished public uh, servants here. Uh, I'm here because I do care, as you know, I'm the County Commissioner for Year One in Allen Park, and I do want to listen to your concerns. I want to hear about the potholes. I want to know the drivers being addressed. <laughs> uh, but uh, seriously, uh, I'm here. Uh, I have my assistant, Hussein Dabaja. I was sworn in uh, just about two, three weeks ago. We we're already dealing with, you know, with an issue. We had a big meeting today in Wayne County about uh, uh, Heinz Park. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with what's going on with, with Heinz Park, but there's been a lot of discussion uh, recently uh, about a possible sale of the uh, mills on along Heinz Drive, but it's just preliminary discussion and the administration today, the Evans administration uh, did a presentation and it was a good presentation. There were a lot of questions from residents and from the commissioners. It's very early stage and uh, 
we will keep you posted. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend. I just want to say something. I have worked with my good friend Debbie Dingell, even on the federal level, since I am her federal political coordinator on behalf of the Michigan Realtors, who dealt with a lot of issues in Washington related to the you know, uh, property owner, uh, owner's rights and uh, things like that. But I'm going to turn it over to my good friend again, Debbie Dingell. I think if people want to come to the mic and start telling us what's on your mind, we'd love to hear from you. And while you're coming to the mic, I'd like to thank Fortson High School for allowing us to use their facilities. And to those of you in the back who are making the mic works and turning the lights on and the officers that are making sure that we're all safe. Thank you for the good work that you do every single day. Thank you, thank you all very much for being here with us tonight and allowing us for this opportunity. I feel there's a lot of stories, I have two questions. The first one is specific to Congresswoman Dingell. There was a lot of stories out today of a possible um, deal that might be made regarding the shutdown. The shutdown is affecting all of us in one way or another through a trickle down effect. And so I'd like to hear from you if you can give us any kind of updates on that. And the second question is for the remainder is auto insurance. What are we gonna do this year? Uh, so I'll take the first question. Did everybody hear the question about? Look, I'm going to tell you that we should never close the government down. Period. It's just absolutely impossible. And now, you know, Rob Portman, who is a Republican senator from Ohio, will introduce legislation in the Senate this week. They should never be able to close the government again. And uh, we're looking at our own version of that. I don't know if it can pass either the House or the Senate, but um, I just. There are just too many services that aren't getting done and too many good people working. I made that point before. Uh, so there are two different things that are going to happen this week. Uh, what's going to happen in the House probably doesn't have, we are going to tomorrow vote on six different bills. I mean, I want you to understand what we're not doing. There are six bills, right? There are seven departments, but six of them the House and Senate conferees, Republicans and Democrats, have met and agreed to what should be in those conference reports to fund those agencies. So we are going to, bill by bill, bring up what has already been agreed to in appropriations process. Which I would also like to just make a point that prior to leaving for the holiday, the Senate voted 98 to 2 to fund six of the departments until the rest for the rest of the fiscal year and the seventh homeland security to fund through february 8th mm. the day that the house of representatives returned on january 3rd we had the exact same vote in the house and passed it in the house that would have funded six of the departments through the end of the fiscal year and would have funded homeland security which is where how we keep our nation safe is going to be funded through. And McConnell, because it was a new Congress, refused to bring the bill up in the Senate because he wasn't sure that Donald Trump would sign it. Last I heard, the United States Congress is equal to the presidency. And we can also override vetoes, and we should have done that a long time ago. <laughs> but having said that, the Senate is what you need to watch this week to see if there is anything possible. Uh, there are reports as of late this afternoon that there would be two votes in the Senate on Thursday afternoon. Uh, one would be for the proposal that President Trump talked about in his presidential address on Saturday afternoon, where I would also like to point out to you, not once did he talk about the 800,000 employees that are currently not being paid. Uh, and it, it, every report that I've heard is that, it, that there is no way that it'll ever get the votes that it needs in the Senate. Uh, there will be a second vote that would fund six of the departments and extend Homeland Security through February 8th. There's some discussion that they may be able to get those votes. They must get 60 votes. I'm not making any predictions. The one thing that I have come to say since Donald Trump was elected president, that anything that you might think 
will happen won't, and anything you think could never happen will. So uh, we need to stop this because we're playing, I mean, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm not using the other word, but I will say this has become a pissing contest that has people in the middle of it that aren't Republicans, they're not Democrats, they're public servants. And if the only good thing that comes out of this situation, which has got economic consequences, it's impacting all kinds of people and all kinds of things, maybe people will understand the important role that public servants play every day. And now you guys can answer our auto insurance, because my auto insurance bill's too high, too. Yeah, raise your hand if you think your auto insurance bill is too high. I mean, uh, I think we've identified the number one issue for the district. <laughs> so where to start? So this is an issue that the legislature has tried to tackle for the last decade, uh, unsuccessfully. Um, it was, uh, you know, Sylvia and myself have, have joined the battle uh, as of two years ago to try to get something done. Um, so I'll speak to uh, kind of my perspective, where I think the lay of the land is now, some of the things we need to bring to the table, some solutions that I believe need to be uh, adopted. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Sylvia for her to give uh, her thoughts as well. Uh, first and foremost, non-driving factors. Uh, if you are a woman, you are charged more. Legally. If you are single, you are charged more. If you don't have a bachelor's degree, you are charged more. If you work a blue-collar job and not a white-collar job, you are charged more. If you live in 41126 and not 41124, you are charged more. These non-driving factors, these factors that have nothing to do with how good of a driver you are, insurance companies are legally allowed to use them to determine how much you pay to auto insurance. So for myself uh, and several others, the first bill, the bill I've authored and, and introduced, um, and I think Harvey Santana introduced previously, was to eliminate the use of non-driving factors completely from calculating how much you pay to auto insurance. Credit score, thank you so much. It's not just credit score, credit ratings overall. Credit score has nothing to do with how good of a driver you are. Uh, we're pushing forth a legislation that says if you get into car accidents, if you have a lot of tickets, that should impact your driving, uh, your, your auto insurance premium. And that should impact whether or not you have a change in your premium. If there's been nothing changed in your driving record, there should be no reason that you're getting a premium increase the next six months. Um, secondly, a fraud authority. Governor Snyder, before leaving office in the last week, uh, fortunately that he finally created the fraud authority, unfortunately that it took him eight years uh, to sign one in, um, created the fraud authority that would be the beginning of looking into the fraud within the system. We had no fraud authority. That means any individuals that are filing fraudulent claims, any hospital providers that are, that are submitting fraudulent claims, any insurance companies that are fraudulently withholding the payment of claims, any trial attorneys that are fraudulently pushing forth claims, uh, we're not investigating. That's the honest to God truth. And a fraud authority has shown in states like New Jersey uh, and other states across the country to decrease auto insurance rates by up to 15% alone just by reducing the fraud. So I think that's something that we need to adopt. Uh, transparency. Uh, each and every single car is charged what's known as an MCCA fee. You'll see that on your premium bill. It's around $190 per year. Per year. That Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association fund, which is a public fund, is not subject to transparency. Rumor has it that it has over $25 billion in the account. We don't know that to be exact, because it's not open. Uh, we don't know how they calculate their formula to come up with that $190 number. We don't know what's being said at their meetings, how long that money is supposed to last, because they're not subject to transparency or the Open Meetings Act, and that's something that we want to do. Uh, another component is what's known as a fee schedule. If anybody here wants to go have an x-ray, an x-ray may cost you, for example, $100, $200 at your local doctor office or your, you know, which, wherever you're going to get that uh, x-ray. If you get in there, injured on the job and your worker's comp insurance kicks in and wants to pay for an x-ray, it's paying maybe $300, $400. If you get injured in a car accident or a motor vehicle accident, and you wanna get that same x-ray, charges up to $2,000, $3,000 for the same x-ray because there's no cap on what providers can bill to insurance companies. And insurance companies have to pay that bill regardless of what they charge. And that's just 
inexcusable that for the same exact tax rate, you can charge 30, 40 times what a regular person would pay walking in through the door and paying cash for an x ray. Uh, another component is trial attorneys. We've all seen the billboards. Many trial attorneys also have equity stake in the medical provider that they're sending you to to get examined. Many trial attorneys collect forever on a claim in a car accident. Many trial attorneys push people who are not injured to feel injured to go to a provider that they recommend to provide you with proof that you may be injured, that you, your way of life has been impacted drastically, that you need to collect, uh, and that needs to be ended. And so how, do I think this can be possibly done in 2019? Yes. The House has launched a new special committee strictly on auto insurance. We have nine members in the House who will be sitting on this committee strictly discussing auto insurance, bringing all the stakeholders to the table. Uh, secondly, we have a new environment. The governor ran on this uh, during her campaign and is on her radar as wanted to get this done. And in the Senate, Senate bill number one, this term is auto insurance reform. So they have signaled that it is their number one priority and hopefully we will get this done this year. Um, I'm optimistic, uh, I also wanna be realistic that unless all the stakeholders come to the table and agree, because this is the issue with the most money that affects the, the politics of Lansing. The trial attorneys, the hospitals, the insurance companies lobby more than any other groups in Lansing. And unfortunately, that's been a blockade for, getting, for, for, for making any progress. So I'm hoping that with a new legislature, with fresh faces, with a new governor, with smaller margins in the legislature, that something will get done. Well said. I'm gonna approach this, well said, Abdullah. I think that um, Abdullah and I can sit up here and labor the issue even further but it's already been labored for 35 plus years in the legislature. And so we know that it's an issue for our constituency. Um, I will just tell you that I represent one of the highest paying zip codes in the nation. Um, the average premium is $15,000 for one vehicle in the zip code 48227. And that was such an eye opener for me that people are paying uh, almost their salaries to, in order to drive. And so, of course, this is an issue throughout the state of Michigan, but it really is an issue in urban areas um, like the city of Detroit, and secondly, Dearborn, who ranks second to Detroit for premiums. But I will say this, um, it's criminal. We are criminalizing people because they cannot afford the auto insurance um, in our state. We have individuals who are driving to other states like Ohio to get their plates, which is illegal, or get their insurance, which is illegal, um, driving to our neighboring states because the insurance rates are obviously much lower. Uh, we actually took up an initiative last term, uh, driver's responsibility fees, and this is something that obviously uh, was also negatively impacting people because they would um, actually um, go to court and then have to pay fees on top of their ticket from not having auto insurance. So we were able to eliminate that in the legislature, which also helped 300,000 um, drivers across the state of Michigan. Um, but I will say this, uh, there's a lot of different variables that go into play when it comes to auto insurance. And as my colleague mentioned here, um, FOIA and um, the MCCA dollars is something that we really need to take into consideration. Uh, we do need to have a rate structure in, play for, in place for not only the hospitals, but also the uh, providers that also provide services um, once the individual has gone home. We want to have a rate structure in place. Right now, there's no consistency across the board. And in order to make sure that there is consistency, we do need to have rate structures in play. Um, when you look at uh, driver's responsibility fees, or excuse me, the driver's responsibility fees, that was an issue that really hurt a lot of people. Um, I will say this too, we wanna hear from you. What do you think we should do um, to help change the insurance rates in our state? Um, we've tried as a legislature to um, deal with this issue for over 35 plus years. And there's conversation now from Mayor Mike Duggan, who's actually pursuing a lawsuit um, to make sure that the legislature acts on uh, insurance and make sure that we look at the policies that are currently in place to make sure that they're not criminalizing people and that no fault insurance is not higher than what it, what it should be. Um, those are some of the areas that are concerning to me. When I knocked on people's doors this summer, I knocked on a um, woman.
in the door in South Dearborn, and she was a senior citizen, never had a, a bad credit score, had a great driving record, and yet she had to get rid of her vehicle and take an Uber everywhere. That's a problem. She does not have that independence in order to be able to drive her car. And so that's the issue across the board. The cost is too high, it's putting people in poverty, it's making the working poor have uh, further debts that are, um, it, that are criminalizing them. And so therefore, you have a large percentage of the population who drive without auto insurance, which, all, which also impacts the rates because the risks are higher for those individuals who do actually pay their auto insurance rate because we're also covering those individuals who can't afford it. So I think that there, like we said, there is an opportunity for a larger conversation. Um, since the first bill that was dropped in the Senate was insurance, it is currently a bill that is a work in progress. I've had the opportunity to read it. Um, but definitely this conversation, you, you change something on this side of the um, issue, it's going to impact the other side of the issue. And so we have to make sure that overall, um, as a legislature, we are working together. And I think that that is um, possible because we do have uh, a tighter numbers, not only in the House, but also in the Senate. And so I'm hoping that, I'm hopeful that as we um, legislate, that we will take that opportunity and make sure that we battle this out and make sure that we have sound policy and sound legislation that impacts your pocketbooks and that reduces your costs. Things in it that are, are um, that 
they're, they're not allowing asylum for certain countries in South America. Uh, there's all sorts of really bad things that are being part of that bill. That's what I heard on the way here from the NPR station. So that, that's my hope to you to stand your ground. Um, the state in, the state insurance companies, why don't we just have that catastrophic non-disclosed um, monies go to mass transportation? So, Laura, I think Nancy's made it very clear. Um, I do think that we all care about national security and we all want to keep this nation safe. What we don't want to do is waste money on something that doesn't work. So I think Democrats are totally prepared to have a discussion about s strong national security, doing what it takes to keep the border safe, but not waste it on a wall. So, but I do have compassion. I mean, there are government workers that have not been paid for 31 days. I am getting notes from them every day. There are secret service that put their lives on the line will take a bullet and die for a protectee, and they're not able to provide food right now for their kids. There are people that are on insulin and are cutting their insulin pills in half because they don't know how they can afford more insulin. I have too many, I just, I don't, I, we cannot give them the wall, but we also have to have a heart and soul for people who are working that aren't getting paid and who are scared to death and caught in catch-22 situations and can't apply for unemployment because they're working for nothing. I mean, it's just, that's all I'm saying when I talk about this. I'm worried about those people. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Biggs, and uh, myself and uh, my wife, Jerry, uh, you all know because we talked to all of you many times about voters, not politicians, and proposal two. Um, one of the surprises of the election is that we elected a, um, it wasn't a surprise because we worked hard for it, but we elected a Secretary of State that is now Democrat and is on the side of us as voters in um, the gerrymandering case that was brought before the, the courts. And they're in the middle of making a negotiation that it could impact all, uh, everybody but uh, Sam up there as far as uh, redistricting. Um, even before the uh, um, Citizens uh, Redistricting Commission would go into effect. I'm wondering how you're feeling about that. Um, do you feel that because of the fact that it's only dealing with partial redistricting across the state, not the whole state, um, whether it's fair or not? Um, and uh, just your thoughts about that. Uh, thank you for your question, Larry. Um, so the question is regarding uh, redistricting and the ongoing uh, lawsuit uh, to do so immediately this year prior to 2020 election. Uh, I can tell you this. Um, any redistricting that happens between now and 2020 is a good thing, especially if it's nonpartisan redistricting. Uh, because the redistricting commission that will come into effect after 2020, after the census, will redraw the lines across the board regardless come 2021 for the 2022 election. Uh, with that said, there are some 30 odd seats, 30 some seats between U.S. Congressional, State Senate, and State House that have been identified as a possible uh, uh, compromise that would go to immediate redistricting uh, come before 2020. To my understanding, there has been no precedent in court to force a immediate redraw within a state senate district that's not going to see an election in the next two years. So uh, I don't wanna be premature in assuming, uh, but I believe that the US congressional seats and the state senate seats are more unlikely to get redrawn before 2020, and rather it would be the state house districts, in fact, that have been identified and compromised it might get redrawn before 2020. Some of those seats are Democratic seats, currently held Democratic seats, and some of those seats are currently Republican seats. Um, and I welcome that redrawing. I would welcome those redistricting in a nonpartisan fashion, but again, everything will get redrawn in the following year, uh, and we look forward to that. I know Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson is, is really spearheading this effort. I applaud her for pushing forth, for not wasting any time. Um, so I'm excited to see what happens, but that court case will be ruled. Uh, hopefully relatively soon. I believe February 5th 
uh, more more uh, uh, the case will move forward. Um, and so uh, hopefully it's only a few weeks away. I, I haven't been briefed, so I know what you know in terms of what you've read in the paper, etc. cetera. Um, we do know that we've seen that there was partisanship in the last redrawn, uh, so there would be election period. So I, I agree. The one thing that my grapevine tells me is it might impact a couple. Okay. I actually, from what I saw in the paper, the districts here would not be districts that would. And I actually think that the. I mean, I view. Everybody calls the 12th district the solid blue district, but when you take the Down Rivers and you take Dearborn and you take Ann Arbor, you got a mini America. And um, so at least I feel that, I mean, I have to work really hard in this district to make sure I'm meeting with everybody. Uh, but I do think we need to have fair or districts and um, thank you for all the hard work you did so that you could win that for 2022. And we'll see. I just, yeah, I, I just don't know what they're going to do. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Reverend Luke Carlson. I live in Dearborn. And I want to first by saying, first start by saying, Congresswoman Bingo, thank you for your Twitter. I watch it every day and I greatly appreciate these little notes from you, even the pictures and videos when we get on, it's a great way to stay connected and see what you're all thinking about and to stay connected to our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. John Big looks even better than I am now. <laughs> He's well, much more nice. football games and so on. We know that our Congressman Bingo. <laughs> a question though for you, Congresswoman Bingo, and then for the state representatives is, I want to make sure we don't forget the least of these. I'm a product of Polish and Swedish great-grandparents who emigrated from the old country, as they called it. And when I see how we're treating prospective asylum seekers or immigrants, particularly when it came out in the New York Times, we can't know how many children were taken away from their parents. In addition to the 2,700 that we know about, there are still several hundred, I understand, that can't be accounted for, that we don't know what to do. I work with Samaritas, and I understand some of the complications, but I don't get how we're not able to find several thousand or know what's happened. That's deeply troubling to me. And for the state representatives, um, Senator Santana, great expectations right at your election. We wish you much, much luck. But I'd like to get a sense from both of you on the state side, how has the environment changed? We don't read a lot about that in the newspapers. I'd like to hear it from you directly. And if I'm standing here 12 months from now, what two things are you hoping will be different because of your involvement. Thank you. So thank you for that question. I want to assure you that we're not forgetting them. I actually think you've got four people up here who immigration's a critical issue for. Um, I now have Rashida as a partner who's working with me on many of um, these issues, but I, with the Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over HHS, which has responsibility because of the refugee program for many of these children, we'll, we will have just organized the last week. And the first hearing, the first three hearings we will have, one of them will be on this very issue. Um, I am in close contact with Samaritas and um, Bethany. Uh, which are the two Michigan agencies. There's some really just very tragic stories. I get, uh, and Bethany, by, uh, which got the initial, was the initial Michigan agency that um, children were being separated from, uh, worked to track every single parent themselves and not work through the system and to reunite the parents. We will have oversight hearings, it will be one of the very first oversight hearings that happens. Don't forget them. Thank you. We're, we're not only are we not forgetting them, but I'm, the families are changed forever. Ever. There's no question. I, I guess I would say I, I don't one of the things about having this many women in Congress is that 
it's an issue we all really care about. Uh, we're there is a group of us going to the border every weekend when we are not in session. And we're going to not stop going to the border every weekend. Um, it, it, so, I mean, one of my colleagues, I wish I could have gone with her. John makes it harder for me to travel some weekends, but uh, some of uh, Lynette Merrigan from California actually helped bring some and stayed with the kids in the cages. And the group of us is going to be doing that in, um, uh, I think I'm going to go in about three weeks. Um, so I promise you we won't forget, but it's important that you remind everybody to not forget. Stop. 
Wayne County Sheriff was on the forefront of saying Wayne County Sheriffs will not be a part of this. The Kent County Sheriff just came out saying their sheriffs will not be a part of this. And so that's a, uh, uh, something that we need to continue all across the state. Um, you asked specifically what are two things um, that 12 months from now I can come back and say that we accomplished. Uh, the number one thing that I, I would like to do, uh, and I'm working in partnership with everyone up here, but I need the support of everyone before me. We have tried time and time again to push forth for air quality change at the state level. And unfortunately, we have been blocked time and time again. So we're bringing the fight to the city level. We have sent last week a city council ordinance to all the city council. And what the city council ordinance would do was crack down on the corporate polluters in the South End of Dearborn. And we need your support and we want to be to employ community residents. What this Ordinance will do, for example, we have a lot of semi-trucks that drive through our communities. These semi-trucks drive uncovered. These semi-trucks drive with freshly made steel slags. And these steel slags release blooms of smog that are filled with manganese that poison everybody that breathes them. And that's just unacceptable. Secondly, there's a fugitive dust ordinance that Detroit adopted that hampers down and all this dust and all the pesticides and all the chemicals are released in the air because of the local corporations that we want to adopt here in Michigan. But we can't do so without pressuring our city council to act and act swiftly. This is something that has gone unchecked for decades and it's about time that Dearborn did something about it. So that's a state level fight that we're bringing down to the city level because we as a, as a city uh, have the appropriate authority to do so. And so we'll count on your support in moving forward that effort. So just reference the uh, 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 Fugitive Dust Ordinance, Fugitive dust. or the air, the air Quality Ordinance that Rep Hamoud uh, and Salah Ali, who I see in the crowd here in the back, um, and Nick Leonard, one of the uh, attorneys, environmental attorneys, has been working on drafting. Why are they giving you a hard time? So we just sent it to them, and now they're currently reviewing through legal process. But previous to this, why were they giving you such a hard time? So previous to this, there's never been action at the city level, unfortunately. And so although we've tried battling this out at the state level, the environmental dynamics did not work in the, at the state level, and so we're bringing the battle down to the city level. So let's be honest, Republicans haven't let it pass. Did you look at the number of environmental things that happened? I mean, we can't pass, PFAS, I want to, PFAS is, we, we don't want the lead that happened in the water in Flint to happen in any community again, but now we suddenly have a PFAS. Uh, contaminant which people are finding in water, it's probably in the Rouge River uh, because of where some of the tributaries have been coming from. But we don't have a national standard for PFAS. We have a warning at a level of 80 parts per billion, which Governor Snyder's, Governor Snyder's task force found was probably set too high. And yet the legislature also passed, uh, like, not these, these, these guys worked against it, but then said that the state cannot put any standard into place that is lower than a federal standard. And we can't even get a federal standard we are reintroducing again, or we had legislation last year, and we've reintroduced it, that required, we required the EPA to set a national standard for PFAS because we have only guidelines right now. So this, you know, you look at Belleville, there was another piece of legislation that will increase the amount of radioactive waste that can be allowed to be uh, uh, stored there. So a lot of things happened at the end of the last legislature, um, uh, environmental regulations that were disturbing. Now you don't have a Republican governor anymore and you've got a tighter, I mean, I'm speaking for them, because there were a lot of things that shouldn't have happened, and we've got to strike, we've got to work loud and strong for clean air, for clean water, for every American in this country. So I forgot to ask, answer your last question. You asked about um, two things that I hope to see happen um, in my tenure in office. Um, one of the key things that I've noticed, I've, I've knocked on doors through this entire third district, and one of the key issues that I find is poverty. Uh, we have the working poor, we have people really struggling out here just to make ends meet. Parents working three and four jobs, no time 
opportunity to actually see their children because they have to work so many jobs you know, just to make ends meet. Um, so one of the key things that I will continue to work on is making sure that at the state level that any issue that might be hindering our constituency from being able to make, have um, revenue in their pockets, um, I want to make sure that we work on those issues and help to support that effort. Um, secondly, public safety is still always a priority for me, and so um, I really champion our police officers and firefighters in the state. Um, yeah. Definitely, they are the first responders and they are um, looking out for us, and I think that as a state, we need to make sure that we, and also our educators, but I want to make sure that at the state level, we are uh, funding their pensions and their health care benefits, and we I found several ways to do that. Um, I introduced a bill uh, regarding an excise tax last term, uh, which is basically uh, a fee that would actually go into, uh, from amusement or entertainment, that would actually go into uh, the health care and pensions of our firefighters and police officers. So I will continue to push that effort because that's something that's important. And um, our first responders put their lives on the line every day. And when they're done with their time, uh, their bodies have been uh, utilized and, uh, you know, they've gone through fires and um, had cancer, you know, sometimes, oftentimes the firefighters might have cancer issues. We want to make sure that at the state level we're doing everything in our due diligence to take care of the people who take care of us. So those are two things that I will continue to work on, poverty and public safety. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Mahdi Ali. First, I would like to thank all of you for making up the time today. Uh, so I live in the south side of uh, Dearborn, and I was gonna bring the uh, uh, pollution topic, but President Hamoud started it, so he makes my job easier. So thank you so much, uh, President Hamoud, and thank you so much for your efforts to bring this ordinance into the city of Dearborn, and also Salah and uh, Link, uh, Link uh, Leonard. And we promise you that uh, we will uh, mobilize the community to support this ordinance and bring them in good number into the city council to support that. So air pollution, I was searching online to see how our area, when I say our area, I'm talking about the area from Ann Arbor to Washington, which is the area that you represent, the area that everybody lives in, mostly. And it's considered one of the most polluted or it has an alarming pollution compared to the other parts of the United States. Um, and a lot of people think you are affected by air pollution or by pollution if you live like just 100 meters from the factory, which is totally wrong. If you do search, you know, and search how pollution like transfers from area to area, it takes like, it, it, it transfers from the factory like tens of kilometers, which means it goes to like tens of kilometers around those factories. So I, you know, I thank you so much for your effort uh, and the pollution. I, I would like to ask our uh, representatives, uh, uh, Congresswoman Debbie Lingo, um, uh, Commissioner Sam, and uh, our new uh, state senator to support us in this, work with uh, Abdullah Hamoud to uh, raise this issue. And now that we have a governor uh, that can listen to us, I think our chance is better than the previous uh, governor. Thank you so much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Howard. Salah, can you stand up and raise your hand for a minute? So I would like to give a round of applause to Salah, who brought this issue uh, to the front. Um, he has been a great part of the work that's been leading this effort. Um, and I've only been able to assist him and Nick Leonard, I don't think Nick is here, um, in this effort. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for mobilizing, mobilizing the community. And thank you for bringing this issue forward. I would say that we can successful in the last year. Consumer power about a year ago, uh, sort uh, it wasn't a year ago because it was at the State of the Union, the, the State of State, um, that we talked to the CEO of uh, Consumer Power, and the next day she withdrew the, the permit request. And when DTE uh, was then going to take on a project, we included all of us from the very beginning. Uh, the mayor, Representative uh, 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 Hamoud, myself, were all in meetings with them 
and told them that they needed to make changes, which they actually, that I, I, we called board, I called board, I talked to, so people, when you work together, you can make a difference, and it's important that the community raise their voice loud and clear, because there clearly are, I mean, we've got issues. So we're all committed to working together on these issues. Not just air, it's also water. Good evening, how are you? I have two really quick questions. We know that the state of Michigan is the state of pothole health. We've got some roads that just, if you go over them, you fall into them. And maybe you can't get out. Why are the fines for the trucks in the state of Michigan lower than, say, Ohio and other surrounding states? That's the first question. Not only are the trucks polluting, they are violating the ordinances and the state law when it comes to weight restriction, driving in residential neighborhoods, driving on the expressway. And they damage the roads. It's not the people. It's the trucks that are damaging the road. And I love truckers. My dad was a trucker when we lived in New York. And he said, make sure you know the weight of your truck and make sure that you are not going to be too high in terms of the route that you're taking. We also know that these trucks damage the overpass because when they route, they don't say, my truck is 15 feet, but this overpass is 14.8. And I'm sure all of you have seen people trying to get under an overpass that was just too small. And they got stuck, they damaged the, over, the overbridge. So my question to you is, what can you do to increase the fines with legislation and can that legislation also include opening up these way stations on the expressway, which would create some money, I think, to fix the roads? That's the first question. And I think this one might be a good one for the county commissioner, Mr. Sam. In Oakland County, they um, were given permission, the sheriff's department was given permission by some of the Oakland County commissioners on the Public Safety Committee to go out to cities to see if they can talk them into a deal to outsource their 911 dispatch service. I don't know about Wayne County, because I haven't looked into it yet. If that were to come up in Wayne County, would you support outsourcing the 911 dispatch to Wayne County Sheriff's Office, or would you do what the people would probably want done, and that's to keep it in house, so those people can keep their jobs, keep their houses, and not have to worry about reapplying for jobs if it goes to Wayne County. Thank you. Um, on the issue of outsourcing the 911 dispatch, uh, this is something that I will definitely look into, and uh, we can discuss this with the, the Wayne County Sheriff and the uh, Evans administration, and uh, this is something, if it makes economic sense, and uh, I'm sure that I would support something like this. I want to touch on the issue of, uh, of the roads. You, you talked about the fines. Obviously, this is not in our jurisdiction. You know, this is the, in Lansing. But one of the biggest problems with our roads is the weights of these trucks. Mm -hmm. We have one of the heaviest truck loads in the country. Uh, Ohio, for example, they're like 8,000 pounds less than Michigan, if I'm right. correct. And uh, so this is one of the issues that it's going to be addressed, I believe, and it's going to take collective effort on the state level and, uh, you know, to pass these new ordinances uh, and, and the, the, the laws about the, the weights of these trucks. Uh, my understanding also that the governor, you know, part of her campaign promise fixing the damn road, she's working on on a proposal or a package that she's going to be unveiling in the next two, three months on how she's going to address fixing the damn roads. So uh, yes, the, the truck weights, it's a big problem. And for those of us that live in Dearborn, you can go to Wyoming and you see what goes on over there. 
on the way to the south end of Dearborn. So, yeah. And I, you know, Abdullah can probably elaborate on the legislation in Lansing and the fines. So as it pertains to fines and, and, and weight limits, uh, I'm a big advocate for lowering our weight limits. Uh, there's no reason that every truck coming from Canada or every truck driving through southeast Michigan is damaging our roads. Right. And in terms prior, the legislature, unfortunately, every time we need to fix our roads, uh, enacts a gas tax or increases our registration fee. But it's not my car, it's not your car that's creating these potholes. And these potholes is, I, was what have generated a pothole tax. Every time you have to change your tire, that's a tax. I had a two for one last winter where I had one pothole and knocked out two tires. Uh, it's something that hasn't happened to me before, um, and unfortunately you had to go through. And what's on top of that is nobody wants to file a claim for their uh, ripped tire, their slashed tire, because your auto insurance is already high enough. And so we all pretty much have deductibles that start at $1,000, and you're paying for everything under that, so you can save on auto insurance. And so we're avoiding filing claims on something that we shouldn't be. We should be making the, the state pay for our slashed tires because it's the state's problem with all these broken roads. Um, so I look forward to Governor uh, Gretchen Miller's plan. Uh, the state of the state is February 1st, and I believe her first budget will be revealed in March. And in March, within her budget, she's revealing her plan. Uh, it's a long-term plan. Unfortunately, it might not happen over a year or two uh, to fix all of our roads, but it's a long-term plan for how she plans to fund uh, the fixing of our roads. Because the report just came out, we're the worst in the nation. And that's not something I want to be worse in the nation of. Um, So in my district, obviously, um, off of South Hill Freeway was where the open end cap got hit a few years back, and we had to um, actually have that open cap rebuild in the district. And that's happened a couple of times in the state of Michigan when you talked about the 14.8 uh, limit as far as the trucks go. Um, we've had several instances of that. And so one of the positive things that I think that we did as a legislature um, that towards the end of our term uh, last fall is we passed legislation that would allow for um, the state of Michigan to be able to um, have a claim for a higher dollar amount. Um, uh, at the time, we were only allowed to put in a claim for $1 million. Now we've increased that amount to $5 million, which also helps us to support um, making sure that we're able to rebuild those uh, overpasses when things like this occur. But I, I think that there is a large <coughs> conversation about weight limits, and um, those are conversations that we will continue to have to help support the road conversation. And I'm hopeful to see what um, our governor comes up with by way of not only roads and infrastructure, but also um, how we can help regulate um, the weight of trucks even further. So. <coughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Ali Al one of the questions is being answered in the road. Because if you go through Miller or uh, Wyoming by the south end, you'll be lucky if you don't have a flat tire. So there is a safety issue at the south end, which is for our children who cross, Gex and Werner going, going to school. Before we mentioned there is a need for bridge over those two roads. We don't know is it the county or the city. And we hope that will be accomplished. Uh, another question for our congresswoman. All of you doing great job, but she did great job. As you know, a few weeks ago, the community lost five members of one family. It was terrible. And I believe Congresswoman submit some kind of idea, solution to the Congress, how to deal with the Trump break you think that would be possible to be accomplished. The other one, no, we have a majority of a Congress Democrat. Is there any way to work suddenly problem for the travel ban? Because a thousand of people get affected and hurt by that executive order from the president. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. So I'll start with the uh, the walking bridges, the overpasses. Uh, I can tell you that I've spoken, uh, obviously, with Sylvia and myself 
That's something we're trying to advocate for in this year's budget, in the state budget. Uh, so we actually want two overpass signs that people can walk over. Um, one is over in the Vernon Dix area, but also in the mosque on Schaefer and Prospect, uh, I believe, because many people walk across that walk across that street, which is a four-way road. It's a very wide road, um, and, that, and that night there are no lights, um, and that is an area that is very prone to accident injury. So we're actually working on securing funding for two walkways, uh, hopefully one in that area and one in the south end. Um, we're we advocating uh, adamantly in this budget. Um, and we'll keep the community apprised uh, of that situation. Uh, secondly, I know you mentioned what Congresswoman uh, Debbie Dingell did at the federal level uh, in tribute to the Abbas family, which is community loss as well as the Northville community, um, and really every community. Uh, we've been also working on a three-bill package at the state level. Uh, the first bill, our current uh, blood alcohol content level uh, standard is 0 .08 determines that you are driving drunk. We're trying to lower that standard to 0 .05. All the science supports it. At 0 .05, your ability to drive has already been altered. Utah has just led the, the way, and they've already adopted a 0 .05 blood alcohol content level, and we're hoping to do the same. Uh, secondly, it's not just about drunk driving, it's about distracted driving. The current law in the book says police officers have to prove that you are texting on your phone for them to issue you a ticket. We're changing that law that if you have your phone in your hand and you're trying to drive your vehicle, that that is distracted driving. We're providing leeway that if you're in a traffic jam, if you're at a stoplight, if you're in the, if you're over on the shoulder, that you're able to use your phone to navigate whatever it might be. But otherwise, you should not have your phone in your hand as you're trying to drive. Uh, and then the third bill, uh, you know, and this was actually brought down to us from Congressman Dingell's office, was that for those offenders that, have, that were driving under the influence, they have gone through court, they lost their license, their license has been suspended. When they want to come back to get their license, we're going to mandate that they have one of the breathalyzer attachments to their vehicles for at least the first six months, and we'll leave that to the judge's discretion. As it is now, it is only up to the judge to determine whether or not that ignition system will be attached to their vehicle. We're going to mandate it for everybody that has a, uh, that has a uh, history of a DUI uh, on their record. Um, those are some things we can do. Allow me to say that though, you know, these measures uh, uh, may not have prevented what happened to the Abbas family, and so I think that's the cultural change that talks about drunk driving and bus driving or any type of distracted driving is not something that we accept of as a society and as a culture.
we do need to make sure that children with special needs, and there's, it, this is actually very much a federal and state level because while the funding comes in for Medicaid uh, from the federal level, it's state laws that actually uh, mandate the treatment and the coverage uh, that the state provides on Medicaid. So we all know that we've really got to make sure that we are taking care of special needs children and education handled. You've got both the health care needs and then the educational needs. And it's a priority for all of us. I don't know if you want to comment about it at the state level. So I think you have some great advocates here because definitely uh, I, in my role on the Senate, I sit on the Healthy Human Her Service budget as well as the uh, on the DHH budget as well. And I know that um, over the past few years for, um, just for autism as a whole, we did fund um, just a study of autism and trying to get um, private insurers to actually take on uh, supporting the needs of autism. So that has been an initiative. Unfortunately, that funding stopped. But definitely, I do agree with you that we do need to do more when it comes to education put, with putting more dollars towards our parapros and making sure that the needs of our, uh, our special needs students are met within the school. So that is a priority. Um, definitely that's something that we'll continue to have a conversation about and also push it as a priority at the state level. Um, I think education is something that's very important uh, and that's why I pushed my first bill out which was mental health first grade as well because I think you have to have uh, ways for teachers to identify students who may be, uh, who may need some support in the classroom and um, that's an opportunity for them to get that professional development training. So the fact that you have two uh, state lawmakers here who sit on that budget, we have a lot of discretion of how we allocate dollars. So I'd love to sit down and talk with you further um, just to get your perspective on what exactly um, we need to help support with. Good evening. Thank you for being here today and for your services to our communities and our state. My name is Zee Shami and I'm the owner of Ziva Cook Culinary Studio in Dearborn Heights. Um, I see about 400 to 500 students every month and I come across a lot of conversations between the students um, throughout my career in this program and they're always talking about you know, what's happening in the city, they talk about Donald Trump, they talk about families who are losing their children or even um, experiencing at school kids who have lost their parents due to being you know, sent back home or you know, a different country. So there's always so many um, discussions amongst each other as well as um, talking about police officers, talking about firefighters, and there came a time where you know we had a discussion about police officers, and there were, some of them were saying they're scared of police officers. So of course, I took it upon myself to invite police officers from Dearborn Police. The chief came, and they all did a nice cooking session together. I've invited the firefighters from Dearborn Heights. They came and they did a fun cooking session with the kids, and they were also able to use a nice half an hour of their time for question and answers. So I think it's really important that we educate our children and in this community and in the state a lot more about what's going on so they can get a clear understanding and that doesn't keep them wondering or afraid um, from not knowing what's going on. So my request would be um, from all of you and especially Congresswoman um, Debbie Dingle, if you could join me at the culinary studio and we can show them the lighter side of politics, the lighter side of, you know, because they're always, they're always like so skeptical about it and nervous about it and I tell them, it's good to be involved. We need to help each other. We all need to volunteer our time. And so I think this is a good way to educate them and show them that we're all human and we're here to provide for our community and educate our, our children. That's one thing. Um, so I would love for maybe even every month a different representative of our state or of our city to come and join us at the studio and talk to the kids. I think they would love that and they would feel very important. So I, I feel like it is important to make our children and our students feel important. Um, that's one thing. So that's an invitation. I'm in. Thank you. <laughs> um, they will be so excited if they find out you're coming. They're just like, I'll oh, sign up for the class. They're going to come with thousands of questions, so get ready. They're really creative with their questions. Um, the second thing is, um, how can we, the community, and how can you get more involved in school?
school. Um, in regards to the environment at schools, I think it's a huge, huge concern of mine is that because I'm always seeing these students, I can tell that there's a lot of bullying going on at schools all the time. And I don't feel like it's safe for our kids because they're so down on each other. Instead of lifting each other up and motivating each other, there's so much bad energy at schools these days. And I just want to know how can we change that? Like, you know, what kind of, what, what more can we do to be more involved? Because the teachers are doing their part to educate them on school matters, but I don't feel like there's enough support system amongst the crowds in the schools where they're doing more one-on-one -on -one talking, you know, with the students. There's a lot of students who really need more love, more attention, more care. And I wish I can go to those schools every day and just be in the hallways, you know, see who's, who seems off, you know, who's not feeling well, just because I feel like they need that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the, they're the future, and we need, to, we need to protect them, and we need to instill that confidence in all of the kids. That's true. And it's just not, it's very weak right now. That's true. That's true. Very weak. That's true. I feel that there's only a few leaders, but then the rest are all followers, and they think it's cool yeah. to do yeah. bad things. They think it's cool to stick their middle finger in there. They think it's cool to swear. They think it's cool to say certain words in a certain way, you know? And it's, it's a shame. It's really a shame. I think we all agree with you. I mean, I think social media is a great thing and a terrible thing. I think that it's, I think, that I, one of the things is that I think young people have stopped developing relationships too. Right. Let me start there. But, and I say that whenever I give a commencement speech, I tell them, to lose social media for a couple of weeks and go out. Detox, and right? Try, you know, detox. detox. But I also think that when people say on social media and the lack of civility and the hatred that oh, comes yeah. out mm -hmm. is, and that people need to stand up when they see someone being bullied, period. Correct. We need to learn to respect each other. But they other. report it. They report it instead. They record the bad thing happening instead of stepping in and saying, what can, you know, and it's all of our responsibilities to teach that to the younger generation. But now I sound old, so I'll turn it over to the young. Yeah, I'd like just to say one thing. Yes. We would be honored to come and meet with your students you. and uh, talk to them about our jobs, what we do, and our life stories. As far as the issues in the schools, I, I've always believed that parents need to be more involved. But they're not. It's a, it's a shame. Well, that's what I'm saying. We need the parents, and, and I, I call on all the parents to be more involved in the PTAs with their schools, and, and because this, this is how they're going to be able to protect their children and make an impact on their life. Yeah. So, I think that everything you said, you had valid points. I think one of the key things with getting more parent, parental participation, um, oftentimes parents are working parents, and so it's True. hard for them to take a day off of work to get into the schools to help support um, any efforts that are going on and just be aware of the environment. But I think what needs to happen is there needs to be a partnership with our business leaders in the state of Michigan to uh, work on having uh, some type of social mission around helping support parents to spend maybe one hour a month or exactly. uh, two hours a month mm -hmm. into the school uh, volunteering with their kids because I think that it's so important to have that interaction for um, not only the student but also with the parents having that interaction um, throughout the school. Um, but secondly, I also believe that at the state level we have tried um, by uh, making sure that we have a campaign called Okay to Say. And so I think we need to push that campaign out further um, into the school districts to make sure that um, young people know that they can contact the state and let us know they've been bullied. They don't know. They don't know they can do yeah. that. Yeah, that information needs to be disseminated better into our communities. And so we have that resource available. We need to do a better job of making sure it gets out into the district. Um, and so we meet uh, collectively, uh, quarterly, with the Dearborn superintendent, um, and have. I think I'm going to meet with him soon. Yeah. I need to talk to him. <laughs> Good. We have several conversations uh, quarterly with the superintendent here in Dearborn. Yeah. Um, I, I've already had a sit down with my Nolandale part of the district, and looking forward to doing the same thing with Great. Detroit. Um, but those conversations are real. Um, I have a 12-year-old. Middle yeah. school is a tough age, mm -hmm. um, and definitely students are going through an array. They affect each other 
hurt so much. And you know, you'll find a good crowd, but then you'll find a bad crowd. And, and if you address the bad crowd, they say, my mom doesn't care. Oh, I can do whatever I want. My mom doesn't care. Or my mom, like, their, their parents, unfortunately, of course they're busy. I'm very busy, you know? But they're, they're, they're not, they don't care. They really don't care. And when, they're, when their daughters or their sons are getting in trouble, the parents are not being parents. They need to be parents and they're not. And guess what? It's affecting our kids, the kids who are good. And, and now those kids at school are learning from the bad kids. It, it's really sad. I mean, I'm sorry. I know I'm bringing it up right That's now. Fine, but okay. I'm very passionate about it. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm a firm believer that it takes a village to raise children. For sure. And yeah. definitely, we have to have these conversations in our community. And I agree with the Congresswoman. We have to teach our children how to be relationship builders and communicate and talk. If um, I can help you in any way. To your kids through text messages. Mm -hmm. I, it's unheard of. Yeah. You have to have downtime, and I think that it's important um, to make sure that our kids have downtime for technology. My kids do not use technology unless it's from school right. Monday through Friday. Right. That's a weekend activity, yeah. but those are the type of things that I think have helped to have balance. And I think mm -hmm. um, definitely that's something that I've done in my household. I'm not saying that, you know, that's for everyone, but definitely um, that downtown from, downtime from technology is good. I think that infuses the violence in yeah, um, so that's something that um, definitely needs to be taken into consideration. But okay to say, um, look on the state website, um, definitely use it as a tool for your young I can pass out the information to all the parents too that I meet with, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you all soon. Zia, I just want to say I want to applaud you for what you're doing. Thank you so God much. bless you and you so you have my support. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. We need to support our teachers too, by the way, in schools. We don't think our teachers are the most underappreciated people in our community with the responsibility that they have. We need to thank our teachers. Hi, my name is Gerald Ronkowski, uh, precinct delegate for Dearborn 35. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. First, um, I want to say congratulations to all of you for winning or re winning, and thank you for wanting to represent. Uh, this, these, the, the districts that you do. Um, I don't know why you want these jobs, but <laughs> congratulations. Um, the second thing, I, especially to, uh, in your role as Representative Santana and Representative Kamuth, I want to thank you for the work you did in the last few weeks of December, trying to keep as much foolishness out of that lame, lame duck session, um, and for keeping us, you know, trying to keep us safe from the last minute shenanigans. Um, I hope that some of those things can be overturned, whether through votes or through the justice system. Um, Congresswoman Dingle, thank you for dealing with the foolishness 35 days a year, right now in DC with the current administration. Um, and Sam, I hope we never have to deal with all of that craziness <laughs> in, you know, in the lame duck sessions. Um, but the, one, the main comment that I really wanted to make, and it sort of goes back to the comments about the, um, the, the closure of the government. Uh, the, comes from being, you said that, you know, that you have to have compassion, and I agree, and it's like every day, it's what, how do you deal with that compassion? I will, I would suggest though, that you, sometimes we have to have long, think of long-term compassion rather than short. And I know these people are hurting, and I, I, I'm glad to see what's happening now who the community is helping them. But I also think not one penny should go to a, a, a wall, and that's because, well, number one, the president who says he, he knows technology better than anybody is going back to ancient technology and not looking at computer and, and real technology to stop this where it's really happening as far as the drug, drug increases. Um, but also, you know, I think one of the focuses, and you can always shut up, uh, is I hope all of you in your capacity will consider Medicare for all. I know a lot of you have been working for it. The time has long since passed. And I think that if we have Medicare for all, and everybody had access to free health care, the people who are now out of work wouldn't have to be cutting their insulin. And they wouldn't have to worry, like this woman today on, on the news talking about having to decide chemotherapy or rent. Mm. We're better than that. And we need, I think what we need to do is sometimes, short term, it's, it may not seem compassionate, but long term, if we can get to a bigger goal that helps them even more, we have to go for it. So please, not one time for that wall. Well, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's either. Well, I mean, I just can't. 
I, I'm worried about these people that I'm talking to. I know I haven't heard the chemotherapy story. I'm going to tell you something. I believe God's put me on this earth to get us Medicare for all once in a while. It's my passion. It is, I am co-chair of the Medicare for All Caucus for the Congress. Uh, John Deagle, I mean, I'm, uh, John Deagle, his father introduced the first universal health care bill in the early 40s. Yeah, but we should have, and it is how Medicare, when John said, when he sees me just get impossibly, he says it takes a while to build that consensus, and Medicare, as we know it, came in the 1960s as a result of his father's work. Then we got chips. Well, the time is here. We just saw a nation in crisis when it took how long to say to people, you have a pre-existing condition, you cannot be denied insurance. And all of a sudden, Republicans wanted to take that back. People are screaming about that across the country. People understand that people are making choices every day. And when you talk about pre-existing conditions, it is things like high blood pressure. It is things like diabetes. Seniors alone, people with diabetes <laughs> $400 a month. It is not fair. People should not have to choose between medicine and eating. They shouldn't have to think about whether they're sick, whether they can afford to go to a doctor, even when you've got a cold. When I go to the doctor with John, it's like going to a town hall meeting because person after person is scared to death. It is time for Medicare for All. I will never stop fighting for Medicare for All. And we all need to work to deliver it to this country. Thank you very much. Very quickly, I just want to say to you, the really cool thing that I think is ha that's been happening now for a while in our district is the greater diversity of the people I see representing us, and I think that's great. You know, we have seasoned politicians, we have young people, we have different races, different people, and this is something that I think has seen a lot of the difference here, in, especially in Dearborn. And I want to say I hope that you all, you know, just come up, come together and use that diversity to get all the perspective, and come to us and let us help you do that as well. So thank you all. Uh, my name is Janet Wachowski. Um, I have two questions. First of all, thank you all for all the hard work you're doing. Um, Congresswoman Dingo, I was heartened to see the legislation you introduced into the Senate that would prevent future government shutdowns. And I was just wondering how that might work and if you think there's any realistic chance that out of this horrible situation, that's at least one constructive thing that might emerge. I think people are really seriously talking about it. I've had multiple conversations with people throughout the day today who are looking at this different things. And I think a lot of, I, I, I will not, I promise you all, we're not gonna give in on the wall, but I am never gonna get to the point that when I've heard the stories that I've heard for the last month, that I'm not gonna worry about human beings that are caught in these difficult situation and we can't this is not a way to run a country and we are stumbling from crisis to crisis businesses need certainty this country needs certainty i think that the one thing president trump may have done is actually created the will on the part of republicans and definitely senator portland the republican who introduced that bill from ohio in the senate and i'm never going to i mean it, we live in a time that you don't know, but I think there is very real, I think you're gonna see a bipartisan group of people introduce that bill. And quite frankly, I may, I think it may be a group of freshmen, because I think that's a great way is to have the new blood introduce it, and then the rest of us are going on as co -sponsors. Yeah, thank you. And then my second question is for our state representative and Senator, if you recall during the recent election, I think that, the big issue was fix the roads. The second biggest one was fix the schools. And although there are problems with the schools that it will take more than money to fix, I think there's general agreement that our schools are radically underfunded and we have to find a way to get more revenue into the school system. And I'm also concerned about the amount of taxpayer money that seems to be going into the pockets of shareholders of for-profit charters and uh, that this is really undermining the <laughs> system of public education. And I'm wondering what you have in mind to address that problem. Well, so you hit the nail on the head. I think the first thing that we have to do is stop raiding the school 
blade fund for tax credits and instead of the dollars that are in that fund should go towards education. And you're absolutely right. We are un underfunding education. I think that there is opportunity um, to fund education at a higher level in the state. And I think that um, we need to look towards corrections. Uh, we spend over $38,000 locking people up on an annual basis in this state. And those dollars should be allocated towards the front end with educating the young people um, so they won't end up in situations where they're being incarcerated. So I think ideally, uh, we need to really look at uh, reappropriating dollars towards education. I think you see other states across uh, this country who do fund education at higher levels. Um, there has been conversation that, oh, well, the, uh, Michigan is a Midwest state. Uh, we don't need to fund education at a higher level because of blue collar jobs. But I think, <clears throat> I think with technology and with where we're going moving forward with STEM, we need to do a better job of educating our students. I think um, there was opportunity um, this last legislative cycle where we did put more money towards STEM projects in our state, um, making sure that schools and students do have opportunity to engage uh, with technology and uh, making sure that they have some uh, feel for um, the future. And so I think that's important. That was done with the Marshall Plan. Um, but I also think that um, we do need to equitably fund education across our state as well. Obviously, other some communities will um, pass a millage to help support education dollars. Uh, you know, as far as making sure that students have the adequate amount of uh, dollars for education or a surplus. But I think also we need to do a better job of that and not put winners and losers. Thank you. I mean, I think unilaterally, right? We need to stop corporate tax breaks. Uh, across the board, because the number one place where that money comes from, it actually comes from the school aid budget. That's where the money comes from. Every time you hear of a new tax incentive, a new tax break, that was money that was supposed to go to schools that, that they now gave away. That's something we need to stop. Um, secondly, as it pertains to schools, we need to pay our educators dignified salaries. They do more with less. And it's simply unacceptable. Uh, the previous comments about what we can do regarding the mental health in schools, we also need to bring more social workers and more mental health professionals within our schools. Um, one of the ideas that we have for actually generating new revenue without increasing the tax on Michigan families is something known as a graduate income tax. What this would do is actually save money for 98% of Michigan families while also generating up to $1 billion of new revenue. And it does go through a marginal tax rate increase, which has been the hot topic uh, in the news given Alexandria Castro for Fed speaking to it. Um, it's a great idea. It's an idea that we have should do this year after year uh, with hope that somebody uh, actually enacts it. If we were to pass it at the state level, it would go to a vote of the people. Um, that is something that would need a, a majority vote. Um, and, and lastly, another idea of generating revenue is uh, something that's known as a tipping fee. For other states and other countries that import their garbage into Michigan, they're paying 35 cents per metric ton. We are the lowest in the country. Ohio, which I don't consider a great state, charges four dollars. We can do, we can certainly do better than Ohio across the board. Uh, you know Washington, which is you know uh, a leader in this area, charges somewhere around thirteen dollars per metric ton. That's something that we need to be doing. One, it stops the flow of garbage into our state. Literally garbage. Okay, uh, it improves recycling and it generates revenue. So there's so many ways to generate new revenue without increasing taxes on folks that we need to consider and actually need to take into uh, need, need to apply. We see an opportunity with this new administration, a newly constituted legislature, to reform the laws around financial disclosure for charter schools and also really financial disclosure and, and ethics at the state level in general. I and mean, this is an area where we are known as the worst state in the nation. We're and worse than we many categories. Become, this become the best state. Yeah, we're worse than many categories. Again, to the comment by Daryl. I'm not sure why we took on this job. Uh, but we're the worst in transparency and ethics, worse than roads. Uh, but we're here to make, uh, make a change. Um, the House did introduce a bipartisan package regarding uh, transparency and FOIA. Uh, and accountability and ethics of the legislature. Um, it will pass the House, but the Senate leader has signaled that he believes transparency prevents bipartisanship and compromise. Um, not sure why that's the case or, or you know, how every other state is able to do it with the exception of us, um, but that's a conversation that needs to be had. 
And so I, I don't have good news for you regarding that transparency. Regarding we're holding charters accountable, there is a bump family on the west side of this state that has deep pockets. And they fund a specific party. I'm not a person who gets partisan in nature, but that's just the I idea. I thought it might help that she's at least out of the state. <laughs> Her family is still here. I can tell you when they passed a law last term that allows charter schools, private charter schools, to not collect the millage money that we uh, pass in counties, uh, immediately over $250,000 in donations made their way to the Republican Party. Um, I, I think there's a strong correlation of uh, of, of how that happened. So unfortunately, I don't see any changes coming regarding charter schools. I believe our governor will do her best to exercise her executive authority where she can, but that is a law that has been passed and until the legislature uh, changes, I won't see real reform there. Thank you. You know, I'm gonna lobby for something right now. I do think that the state's ethics laws and transparency laws is absolutely a criminal. Yeah. And the same people that got gerrymandering across should lobby at it. You, when they say we can't do anything, but when the people come together and say we need to get big money now, we need to see what, I mean, just transparency. You don't even have to ban it. I mean, I, nobody, I'll tell you something, at the federal level, I don't take a cup of coffee from anybody. We have transparency, we file ethics reports, we put what, uh, all of our holdings, we have to do transaction reports. I'm very proud to say, I have never taken a trip during my entire four years in Congress entering my term. I just don't, but all of that has to be public too. I would be, a, if you have transparency, you're accountable. I hope you all take that on. I hope the group that got here, that should be the next issue that we take on and make, get a ballot gonna, proposal if we can't get it through. I was gonna ask you guys that, because uh, we're in, the fact, in fact looking at our next task. Exactly. Well, that's part of it. Transparency is corporate donations, transparency, it's all, we can help you. <laughs> I just want to say, I think the other aspect of your conversation about transparency, I think that it's really important for not only our constituents to be aware of what's going on, but I also think that we do our part as lawmakers, especially on the appropriation side, to make sure that we're holding the departments accountable. So if you go to the Auditor General's website, you can see some of the reports that we have um, requested um, throughout the terms in office. That's a great way to see what the state's doing. But I would love to see an audit of the entire state budget personally. Um, I think that's something that's very important. I also would like to see a roll down of the budget because we see the larger numbers, but the detail, the devil's in the details, and that's where we really need to do a sound job of making sure that your dollars are being spent and allocated accordingly um, to the needs of people. And I think that is something that's very important and I'm looking for success. Last question, oh, thank you, Sophia. Last question of the night. Oh, so good evening. Uh, uh, or statement. Yeah, sure. Both. Uh, my name is Lali, and uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Representative Abdullahi. A lot of your work he has put in uh, towards air quality improvement. Um, I know when he first, uh, just for everyone to understand the type of uh, uh, representative he is, when, I first, when he ran for election the first time two years ago, I never knew the guy. Uh, but yet again, he held a town hall meeting in our area, um, and he represented uh, some of his uh, uh, missions and plans to improve the area. And one was air quality, and that's one of my biggest concerns in the area growing up in the South End. Um, so since then, it was like a work uh, love at first sight, if you will. <laughs> um, but and again, um, it, it's it, clean air, um, air quality has been one of our biggest concerns, um, whether it's uh, uh, what's called a single source uh, uh, pollution from uh, smokestacks or uh, mobile source pollution from semi trucks or slides that's being carried from one facility to another. So um, I've been on him for the last two years in trying to come up with a plan to improve. Um, and due to the uh, uh, partisanship at, at the state congress level, um, it's very hard to pass bills well, to improve air quality because the fact of the matter is. Um, the laws are set by uh, 
uh, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, and every corporation is obligated to follow those laws. And until we change the laws, the conditions aren't going to change. So we need representatives and state legislators like a bill level in Congress, state Congress. Um, so it, it was difficult then, but uh, I, I kept pushing. It, it's not enough to say, you know, uh, my hands are tied. So that's which led to the ordinance that we're about to pass. So thanks to his leadership, uh, working with attorney uh, Nick Leonard, uh, we're about to, we have submitted a, a fugitive dust ordinance to the city of Dearborn, which will regulate the, uh, 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 the dust and the billowing of smoke uh, during the transport. And we're hoping with Commissioner Bay Dune um, with the roads, um, because the roads cross in the South Dearborn between Wayne County and City County, uh, we would look for your support as well. So with that said, now on a federal level, um, uh, as we know, some of the regulations set by the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality is set by the EPA. So Congresswoman Dingle, I'd like to know what your plans are on a federal level to improve the air quality. So we had a real problem, which is that we have an EPA who's trying to roll back every major air pollution uh, regulation that's been written as well. This is asthma. This isn't a cold, by the way. This is asthma that I never had until last year. So I, the air quality has, you know, I mean, I'm learning that this is what the children have and that more and more of us in Dearborn are developing this. So you actually have an empathetic soul here too because of um, paying the price here a little. But um, we are, what the first three hearings we're gonna be having in the Energy and Commerce Committee as Democrats take back over, global climate and emissions is gonna be uh, one of the other issues that we will be addressing. And we are going, we will be passing, we will be passing legislation. This is the problem, it's like it is at the state level too. We will be restoring or overturning or re-regulating several of what's being turned back at EPA. But again, the problem is that you gotta get it through the Senate and have the president sign it, which is a real challenge, but we are going to uh, continue to push forward on the fact of the matter is that there are some stringent air quality standards that exist, existed before the Trump administration came in, uh, and that they have rolled back in terms of some of the uh, air permits, etc. So I'm very focused on a number of other things too, the clean water, the P PFAS, and some of those. Uh, regulations as well. And then we can also talk about automobiles, which we've got fuel efficiency, but it's also those emission standards. And we need to set regulation going out. We've got regulation in place through 2025. We need to re-regulate through 2030 and set goals for 2050. We need to get more electric vehicles on the road and eliminate carbon emissions. But people aren't buying electric vehicles because we don't have an infrastructure system in this country to support electric vehicles and people aren't buying them because not only of their expense, because they don't trust the range of the battery right now before they can find a charging station. Uh, I've invited Alexandria, otherwise known as AOC, to come out and help me take on building that infrastructure to support how we encourage more sales of electric vehicles. We, I'm going to, I'm looking at introducing a sense of the Congress resolution about what our target should be in terms of reducing transportation emissions by 70% in the next few years. We're working on a number of things. Okay. I'm um, probably surprising you. No, no, uh, actually, um, I know the emission standards before even the Trump administration were pretty bad. Um, uh, they've always been bad, they just haven't improved since then. Um, and 
what, what is a known fact that many don't know is the standard that SET is already poor as it is, and it's based on a single standalone manufacturing site. But now when you have multiple manufacturing facilities side by side, there's a cumulative uh, factor that's not taken into account in these logs. So let's say hypothetically, the standard is set at 30% per manufacturing. But when you have five manufacturing facilities within a mile radius that all emit 30, you're over 100% of the allowance. So these are the cumulative effect that is being imposed in the area that's not being uh, standardized nor controlled. So I, I'm just hoping in the process where you, you have these dialogues that you can introduce some of these facts and have a plan to improve. We will. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm, I'm not, I also would say to you that the stationary, so you're talking about stationary source admission, there have been problems in terms of, there are some standards set for what happens in an area, in a region, and that we've had issues with where the testing mechanisms have been placed and that they've not been capturing uh, what it is and we have put pressure on the EPA to establish more monitoring stations and to do a better job of trying to do that and we did get that we got them to agree to more monitoring stations as we were working the DTE issue no I totally agree and I, I mean I, I've been yeah. working I just want the record to show that Adela will tell you I was the one that went to Consumer Power and went to the CEO and said what you did was wrong and it's gotta be changed. No, absolutely. But okay, yeah, so yeah. I don't want you to think that work's not being done. No, 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 and, and none, uh, I, there was no thought of that whatsoever, but what, what the problem lies is the law. Uh, you can monitor all you want, as long as the law allows it, it they'll keep on continuing and polluting. It's just law, it's the regulations. EPA sure. issues the regulations, and EPA roll back the regulations. So, but at a state level, there are also laws that can manipulate and alter the regulations. That's where the state level of Congress comes in. So, um, but nonetheless, we appreciate the work. I'm just trying to provide visibility to some of the concerns that we have in the area. Um, and then uh, State Senator uh, Santana, um, I know you're new to this. Um, I know some of your concerns are poverty and public safety, I believe. But I, I would just hope you would include air quality in the mix because they're all intertwined. If the air quality is bad, it affects the poverty areas and it, it ruins public safety because now you have uh, areas that aren't as safe. So um, Representative Abdullah Mood has the history that you could share some of the information with and hopefully be able to work and help with that as well. And we have partnered on, uh, and Adela and I have partnered on legislation around air quality as well as holding the DEQ accountable with the permitting process as well. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the Salina School um, Town Hall and one of the things I took away from that whole experience is that, uh, one, we need to have more public hearings prior to a decision being made. Um, number two, we also need to have on the board of the commission that are making these decisions at the state level, we need to have individuals in communities that are highly impacted by air quality, water quality on that board seated at the table talking about the issues from the level of the community. And so I think that's something that's really important and I know that we will continue to partner to make sure that that happens. All right, thank you all very much. So I think we're concluding uh, the town hall. Thank you so much for coming here. I think we, each of us will go into quick closing remarks. Um, I'm gonna stand, and you can probably see my legs. Uh, I'm eager to stand, and I have more than anything just a call to action. Um, and it's regarding the air quality ordinance. I think that's what we're gonna call it. The air quality city ordinance. And we need your help. Uh, and so are you all with me right now? Yeah. Are you all with me right now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so here's what we need to do. We need to reach out to city council, and we need to ask them that, to take up our air quality ordinance uh, in a speedy fashion. This ordinance will improve the air quality in our city so that every child, regardless of the zip code that they are born in, has a better opportunity to live a healthier life. If we bring this about to our city council, if our city council takes this up, and I certainly hope that they will, we can enact real change here at home. And this is something that we need to do collectively. We have titles, we have platforms, but we're simply elevating your voices. But we have an opportunity to continue our work together right here in our backyard. And so I'm hoping that you can join myself, my colleagues, uh, Salah and Nick Leonard, and the rest of the community who's already been putting, putting forth a strong effort in enacting this change. 
So again, reach out to city council, write your city council person, write everybody, uh, or even write the mayor, and ask them to take into strong consideration this air quality city ordinance, which will improve the lives of our residents. Thank you. Thank you all for allowing me to um, listen to you, to hear your concerns at the state level. We are definitely um, encouraged and still looking forward to making sure that we do a good job representing you in Lansing. But I have a call to action too. Uh, it goes beyond the vote, and all of you are very savvy and you are very informed. But I also want to encourage you to um, talk to those neighbors, talk to those community organizations, talk to those individuals who are not engaged in the process get them educated about their legislative process so that they also can not only help support the causes, but also make sure that their voices are heard in Lansing. Um, there's always opportunity when we meet for committees to have testimony. Please, if you can't make it to Lansing or drive in Lansing, take that opportunity to make sure that your testimony is heard on the written record because not only does it matter that you have elected us to represent you in Lansing, but also to have your voice heard even on a louder platform is most important to us and making sure that we can back the issues that you care about and that we want to make sure that we fight for. So I want to say thank you all. God bless you. And I definitely look forward to continuing to serve you in the State Senate. Again, I want to thank you all for being here on this uh, cold and rainy and snowy uh, evening. Uh, I really enjoyed being here uh, with all of you, and I hope we answered all of your questions. Um, I just want to say something uh, about the South End. Last year, it was in January of uh, 2018, I believe, when uh, Representative Abdullah Hamoud had the town hall meeting there. And when the community comes together and we unify, they can hear us. And I believe because of the action that he took, that they, he, you know, they changed their plan. So as a Wayne County Commissioner, during the campaign when I was running, I said the South End, you know, all of Dearborn and Allen Park there in my district, they're all important. But especially the South End, I want to reaffirm my commitment to the South End it's really sad what's going on in the South End. It's, it's the, you know, I call it the environmental injustice that's going on in the South End of Dearborn. I attended a meeting on December 6th at Salina School. Uh, this is the issue that came up earlier, but our Representative Abdullah Hamoud couldn't be there. We talked about the safety of the children crossing Bix uh, uh, to come to, to the school, and we talked about building an overpass. And, you know, hopefully uh, the state senator and representative Abdullah Hamoud can come up with the money. So just reach out to us. If there's, an, if there's an issue, don't hesitate. You know, we're all visible in the community. Send us a message on Facebook. My phone number is, is, is you know, I'll, I'll give you my business card right now. I'm sorry, not my business card, my county commissioner card. You can reach out to us. And my legislative director, Hussein Gabaja, is here with me, any concern about the roads, anything that has to do with the county, even if it's not a county issue, and it has to deal with the state, and you know, just bring it to my attention and, and I'll get it to the right people. Thank you again for being here, and thank you, my good friend, Debbie Dingle, for arranging this town hall meeting. Let's hear it for her, thank you. So, I wanna thank everybody for braving the, it's really nice up there, so. It really matters what you think. I mean, when we talked about doing this, again, we, the two of us have done it many times and we're very glad to have two new partners um, at this level and we want to do it regularly. There are a lot of issues that people care about. We got a lot, of, I can't, I'm not old, but I'm seasoned. I uh, admit that. But I got a lot of energy and I got a lot of passion. But I can't remember this country being divided by fear and hatred that we are seeing right now. Nor, if you would ask me at this point in our life, if we would see the number of things we are witnessing, witnessing what's being rolled back that Flint would be poisoning its water, that we ourselves have to worry about the fish that we eat, or, I mean, yes, the Rouge River has been cleaned up to some extent, it does have fish back in it, but we have to work, we have many things to worry about. I, I, I mean, it's time.
time for health care, we thought, okay, we were making progress five years ago, all of a sudden, they're turning the clock back on health care. Pe seniors are worried about whether their social security is going to be there. So people who have worked a lifetime put money in, forego increased wages so that they have a pension when they retire, or suddenly worried about whether they're going to have a safe and secure retirement. People aren't asking for a lot. There are working men and women in this country that just want their basic needs. We need to talk about it. We're all going to fight for it. We do worry about the environment. We all work on the environment together. We work very hard. We try to, we've got to, you know, the businesses are there now. So the question is, how do you clean up what's there? And it also provides a tax base. And yes, we know that there are jobs. But doing something as simple as getting the trucks, I mean, it's not complicated. If trucks cover what they're transporting, it's going to keep us from filling the air and poisoning our kids, let alone a senior. Like I'm not a senior, I'm bad. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we need to talk about it. We want to work together. So we're glad. We're going to have lots more discussions. We all kicked off. This is my first town hall of the 116th. Um, the co Congress, Dearborn's home for me. Where John and I live, we'll keep living, and so we all want to be with you tonight. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.